The Tom Woods Show, episode 1886. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Well, our guest today has written a book on the unlikeliest of topics. And that topic is curiosity. And the book is called Curiosity and It's 12 Rules for Life. And at first I thought, there's just no way you can pull off a book like this. But then, as you read it, you realize that people who are incurious really are the problem. And that the distinction between the curious and the incurious is actually at the heart of so many important things that go into making us human. So I thought, what the heck, we got to talk to this guy. And of course, it's our old friend, Frank Buckley, who's a professor at George Mason University Scalia School of Law. Uh, we've had him on before. He's the author of American Secession, The Looming Threat of a National Breakup, numerous other books. He's senior editor at the American Spectator, columnist for the New York Post, and has written all over the place uh, for the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and so on. Professor Buckley, welcome back. Well, thank you for having me. Great to be back. When I saw this book, I have to admit, I had a bit of skepticism. I thought, how is he going to pull off a book on curiosity? And then after chapter one, where you, or the very beginning, where you make your case for it, and you lay out a skeletal description of each chapter, I thought, okay, how would you not have a book on curiosity? I, I was completely convinced instantly. Now, the 12 rules for life thing does seem a little bit familiar to me. Yeah, for, right. Yeah. So how, okay. how did you come upon the idea of doing this in the first place? Well, so I'm kind of a, an easily bored guy, and I think like most of us are, you know, and we were the kind of guys who were daydreaming in grade school, you know, and the teachers kept, you know, trying to wake us up. So, you know, I'm a law professor, and I see all the work that's being done by other law professors, and it bores me to tears. So I wanted something totally different. And when you write a book like this, one of the things you want to do is you want to get a good reading list. Like you want to read stuff that, that's just fun. And then the other thing is, hey, we're, we're emerging from the COVID year. We're in the middle of a crazy Black Lives Matter season of looting and rioting. It's supposed to be criminal to think about anything other than you know, the left-wing politics of the day. And you know, I just want to say enough. Can we have a normal life again? Can we go back to, you know, even 2019, okay, when when we were able to look around and do different things and we could enjoy sports, right, without having politics, uh, you know, being intruded in all of that. So, you know, curiosity, yeah, that's what we need. We need more of that. You know, and then there was this uh, book by this guy called Jordan Peterson with 12 Rules for Life. And it was instantly recognizable because I moved to the States from Canada. And so I kind of recognize where Peterson is coming from. His 12 rules for life. You know what that is? It's Canadian. It's like, how do you survive in a cold climate, you know, where everything is forbidding? And, you know, that's really dour and chilling. And I wanted to say, you know, there's kind of more to life than just surviving right? There's kind of profiting from all of the experiences of that life throws your way, kind of picking it up, running with it. And so I decided, you know, fine, 12 Rules for Life by Peterson was a great book for Canadians, but I wanted to write a book for the more fun-loving people I met when I moved to the United States, okay? And, you know, and, and the only problem is in the last year, everybody's kind of turned into uh, Jordan Peterson right? Or at least conservatives have. And I wanted to say, you know, you know, let's, let's have more fun. And how do you do that? Well, you know, you kind of do that by taking risks, by opening Pandora's box, by, you know, doing all the stuff that sometimes gets you into trouble, but makes your life a whole lot more rewarding. And so, you know, one of the things I did is uh, I had to deal with Eve and the Garden of Eden, okay? Because our first story in the Bible is curiosity is really a dangerous thing. It was Eve's curiosity that got us booted from the Garden of Eden. And so you know, we begin with the idea that there's something very dangerous and you know, maybe even a little evil about curiosity. If you know. But then, you know, as I thought about it, I realized, well, 
you know, God had the choice. God created a curious person, right? God created a curious Eve and a complacent Adam. And if God had created an incurious Eve, none of this would have happened. So then you ask yourself, well, you know, if if Adam and Eve are in the Bible, the ancestors of humanity, would we have wanted an incurious Eve? In other words, would we ourselves want to be totally incurious? And of course, the answer is no, right? So Eve's curiosity was a kind of a happy full, right? It, it made us all curious and, you know, mostly for good, sometimes for bad. We take risks. Not, not everything pans out. But we wouldn't have wanted to have the curiosity removed, gene removed, right? You know, like it seems to have been by the politics mad people on the left. And then, you know, realizing that curiosity would have a special appeal for conservatives, I thought, you know, we have this thing about liberty, conservatives do. So tell me, what would the point of liberty be if you have no curiosity? If you have no curiosity, right, you know, you can do whatever you're commanded to do and it won't bother you, right? You can you can be told to just do mindless, boring, repetitive stuff, invest in, you know, make your life all about Black Lives Matter, whatever it might be. And, uh, okay, we won't have problems with that. If we do have problems, right, you know, if attendance, if the viewership of the Oscars this year was was down incredibly, it's because we get bored. You know, the interesting philosophical question, I thought, is, hey, where does boredom come from, right? You know, if you want to talk about it in terms of evolutionary biology, we, we've got this boredom instinct. It makes us get up and do things. And that's really, really healthy. And sometimes they're dumb. But if on occasion we didn't do dumb things, nothing important would ever be invented. Right? It's only that kind of trial and error. So I, I said to myself, right, okay, you know, Jordan Peterson gave 12 rules. I'm going to give 12 rules. And that got me started basically making heroes out of risk takers, you know, out of people who wanted to do things differently. And the more I thought about it, you know, the really interesting people are the curious people. You know, the stick in the muds, you know, fine, They're, they may be good, decent people, but nothing great comes from them. So whenever, you know, whenever there's greatness, whenever something wonderful new is produced, it's produced by curious people, by people who were bored by what's out there. So here we are, you know, it's 2021. We're living in the most incurious of times. And hey, well, how about we wake up and put all that aside and kind of begin life again? That was the idea. Well, I like it. And you say at some point something along the lines of you can either be curious or you can be a bore. Which one would you like to be? And I think I know which one I would prefer to be. I don't want to make this entirely about politics because you you have so many interesting things to say other than that. But I can't help pointing out how incurious most people are these days. You said it's the most incurious of times. I agree completely. Most people go through an educational plan of K through 12 and emerge with a worldview that's been just given to them in a package. And, and I can tell you the the 10 planks of it. Every kid out of it, coming out of every school believes every one of the 10 planks. But the, it's the handful who wonder, could there be another way of looking at the world other than what my teachers told me? But it's only a handful. Those are the interesting, curious ones. The incurious ones are the ones who think on Twitter, it constitutes an argument simply to repeat one of the 10 planks to me, as if I've never he I haven't heard this a million times. Yeah, it's really terrible, isn't it? You know, you know, this got started 20 years ago. There was a Palestinian writer called Edward Said who wrote about English novels, all right, Jane Austen in particular. And he blamed James Austin for not revealing that in some cases the family wealth came from Jamaica planters, you know, who, who had slaves. And, and everybody at the time thought, hey, this is really horrible. You're taking a piece of literature which we're supposed to enjoy, and you're saying, don't enjoy it because politically I think it's suspect. 
And that's, you know, that was 20 years ago and we all thought it was crazy, but now that's the way we live today, right? You look at everything, everything is supposed to be through the prism of politics. You can enjoy, you know, if you're in English literature, you can enjoy a good novel or poetry, whatever, without looking for a political message, right? You want to enjoy a baseball game? Well, you know, Major League Baseball has kind of moved on to politics. Football's been there for a while. Okay. Sports is a matter of curiosity. So who's going to win, right? Well, you know, it doesn't matter so much. Winning isn't such a big deal. It's are you really woke enough? And and then the experience, you know, look, K to 12, you've been there, is boring enough already, right? You got to make it more boring by preaching politics. You know, the, there, there were these little moments in K-12 where the light bulb went off and, you know, almost against our will, we found ourselves reading some poetry and we think, hey, this is okay, right? And now we won't have that experience because, you know, it's all about politics. You know, life is like this one long droning sermon where you just tune out. I mean, I'm sure you've sat through a bunch of sermons and I bet you your mind wandered on occasion. And that's kind of what life is like, right? It's it's sermonizing 24-7. The media, the newspapers, all of that stuff, 24-7 politics. Enough. Let's break out of it. Let's just thumb our nose at that. Agreed. And that's thumbing our nose at the left. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Now, in chapter three, you hit a bit on entrepreneurship. And I think there's another angle there for how curiosity factors in. Because the entrepreneur has to be, he can't be self-centered. He has to be curious about others. He has to be curious about what would please them. He can't just produce what he thinks they ought to want. So he has to have some, at least some level of empathy. He has to get into their hearts and minds. And that makes him, by definition, curious. Yeah, you know, that there's a broader point there about curiosity. And yeah, it includes the entrepreneur who wants to make something consumers-like. So you have to know something about consumers. But even more generally, right, if, if, if you want to make friends, if you want to have a romantic relationship, you got to start with the idea of curiosity. You're curious about the other person. And in fact, I say, look, you want to know if you're in love? I tell you, you don't necessarily know. Here's the test. Are you obsessively curious about the other person? Like you want to know, where did she go to school? You know, what, what was she like when she was eight years of age? All of that stuff. If you're curious like that, then you're in love. If you're not, you're not. Okay? That's how you tell. Curiosity is... It's what brings us outside of ourselves to meet and entertain other people. You know, we have these duties to look after other people, and one of our duties is to entertain them. I was just going to bring this up. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, right. There are people who are, by nature, great entertainers. What's special about them is they know what other people are going to find funny. You know, there are guys who can do stand-up, and they're magical, like they just know they've got it. And it's what you say, it's empathy, right? It's a sense of this is what the audience wants. That's true of the entrepreneur. It's true of the stand-up comedian. It's really true of anyone who wants to make friends with other people and who realizes that his life is incomplete if he doesn't do so. You know, I tell the story in the book about a friend of mine. It was actually a friend of a friend and he got cancer. It was inoperable. It was a terrible thing. And he tried chemo and, you know, his, you know, his hair fell out and he just gained a lot of weight. And he looked at the mirror one day and he realized, you know, I look like a clown. So what he did in the short time that remained to him was he bought a clown costume and he learned some tricks and he went to, he entertained children in a cancer ward. Right. So, you know, he passed. But in the time that remained to him, out of curiosity about how to entertain people, he ended up with a good life. Well, let me ask you a little bit more about that, because when we talk about being entertaining, that is one of the rules in your book, be entertaining. Yeah. This is not a question necessarily of having something to say versus not having something to say, because some of the biggest bores in the world have far too much to say. I have in mind 
a young philosophy professor I knew when he was a graduate student. And maybe it was because he thought he needed to impress people, I don't know, with his knowledge. But every time he was at a meal with me or in, in other faculty, it was nothing but him talking. It was just a barrage of information no one wanted or needed that everyone at that table knew already. And it just went on and on nonstop. And now I go out of my way to avoid this person. So it isn't that he didn't have anything. It's that he didn't understand what it meant, what it meant to interact with people in a way that's, that's mutually beneficial. Hey, hey, Tom, I teach in law school. Tell me about it. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, you know, the, the point about people like that is what they've lost is the empathy to realize what the reaction of the other person is. Yes. So it's a good thing to be able to entertain, but just talking about yourself isn't entertaining. And to realize what the problem is, what you've got to be able to do is get into the skin of the other person. You also have to have, here's the other point about curiosity. Curiosity involves knowing what other people like, what other people find amusing. It's also a question of looking into yourself and seeing your own faults, right? So, you know, the bore who goes on and on and on and on lacks self-knowledge about himself, right? And I got to, you know, I don't want to talk about politics, but I have to say the besetting sin right now has to do with people who are mean-spirited and are looking for meanness in other people. Yes. And with more self-knowledge, they'd realize that they're the problem. So, you know, all these guys with their woke signs in their lawns, you know, if, if they knew more about their own heart, they'd realize they're the problem and they don't, right? They're all about, you know, boasting about how wonderful they are as compared to their deplorable neighbors, but they're the problem. These, these are the people who are morally problematical. And, you know, and I... When I talk about curious people, sometimes they're artists, sometimes they're philosophers. And, you know, I talk about how Plato said that evil is always a problem of self-knowledge, right? Evil is always ignorance, right? Ignorance is the root cause of evil because if you knew what really was good for you and other people, you wouldn't be evil, okay? So, you know, with with more knowledge about yourself, you'd be a better person. Maybe, maybe, you know, and and Plato said that's that's really what it's all about, knowledge about yourself. So curiosity about oneself, looking into one's soul and 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 realizing that, you know, the things you do are questionable. Not just the things you do, but the things you don't do. You know, one one of my I have a couple of little heroes in the book. One of them is is the French writer Albert Camus, and Camus talks in one of his novels about a guy who's wandering across a bridge in Paris. And he passes this you know, this youngish blonde lady who's on the bridge, and he passes her. And after he passes her, he hears a splash, and he hears three cries for help. Evidently, she's just tried to commit suicide. And he realizes that he's called upon to save her, and he doesn't. And his life changes at that point because he realizes what a hypocrite and fraud he was. And the point of the story is we're all the man on the bridge. There always were people we were meant to do something for, to save, and we didn't do it. With more knowledge about ourselves, we'd realize that who was it? I think Solzhenitsyn said the line between good and evil runs through each one of our hearts. So, you know, the beginning of morality is to realize that we ourselves can be flawed people. And that requires curiosity about ourselves. That requires looking inward. It's very easy not to do. And with more curiosity, there'd be more examinations of our conscience. And I think there would be more sincere apologies, which is an extremely rare phenomenon in this world because of this. Yeah, that's really true. That's a good point. I think that's true. And likewise, of course, a, a clear and obvious example of what we're talking about. And again, I, I really, I would just this would be the last political thing I say, but it's very obvious that there are a lot of people who have taken no time whatsoever to figure out 
honestly and without caricature what their opponents believe. They just know that their opponents must be motivated by hatred or X, Y, or Z, which I think reveals an awful lot more about them. But they have no curiosity about it at all. And it's interesting that Jonathan Haidt actually looked into this and found that if you ask progressives to explain what is the conservative or libertarian worldview or what, what do they believe and why do they believe it, and then you, you ask conservatives to do the same for progressives, the latter are far, far more accurate. They know much, much more about what exactly they're dealing with, what their opponents think. Progressive, they have absolutely no idea. Maybe we're all just lackeys of industry. They, they have no way of, of accounting for it or we're motivated by hatred or we want to bring back slavery or what. It's all hysterical craziness. And there's something deeply incurious about that. Those are great points. I think you're exactly right. And I think it explains why conservatives slash libertarians have more understanding of the other side. And the reason is, hey, that's the world we live in. You know, you pick up a newspaper and it's there. You you watch the, the, the TV and it's there. They never hear our side, okay? So they're permitted to think of it in terms of the caricatures that they get in the press about how evil we are. But they, you know, they're, they're not asked to encounter it as, as we encounter their point of view all the time. All the time. Well, you know, okay, maybe that's uh, good for our soul. <laughs> right, indeed, indeed. It, it, is, it is forging something in us, uh, I will say that. Hey, everybody, let me just get a word in here to thank our sponsor, Merck Research. I am sure many of you are tired of hearing there's going to be a stock market crash just around the corner every day for the last 10 years. Well, our friends over at Merck Research provide unbiased monthly analysis on the economy and stock market. And through a consistent set of easy-to-read charts and frameworks with written analysis, these monthly reports provide an intellectually consistent view on the market and economy. You can download the PDF chart books with analysis or watch the video voiceover walkthrough. Their goal is to help you better understand what's really going on and ultimately to help you make better investment decisions. Almost all financial media, like all media, has become fear-mongering clickbait. And if you're tired of the nonstop and inaccurate doom and gloom and want an objective and insightful summary of what's going on in the market and economy, go over to tomwoods.com research for a no-risk three-month free trial. And it's only $20 a month after that. So for your no-risk three-month free trial, check it out at tomwoods.com research. I want to move all the way up to chapter 13 for a minute because when you discuss the specialist I can't help thinking of 2020 because just maybe a week or two weeks ago, Dr. Fauci was asked, why is Michigan, which has been notoriously locked down through so much of this, doing so much worse right now than Texas, which is completely open and had a full stadium for the Texas Rangers that everybody went hysterical about and all that, and the best he could come up with. I mean, sometimes you think maybe these so-called experts, maybe they really do have some profound explanation for these anomalies. Maybe they do, and I just haven't heard them say it. They don't, it turns out. His answer was, well, what matters are not mandates, but behavior, and Texans are behaving better than people in Michigan. Now, how can that possibly be? People in Michigan are under all kinds of restrictions. Texans can do what they want. How could, how could this possibly be the explanation? All you have to do is go to Michigan and look around at the people, these dispirited people. We know this can't possibly be the explanation. And yet there's no curiosity. There's no stopping and saying, maybe we don't, maybe it's going to take years before we fully understand what was going on here. Well, he can't even say that. You know, um, what you describe right now doesn't sound like science, does it? <laughs> no. Uh, no. You know, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a scientist. There was this little thing called Chemistry 111 kind of, kind of got in the way. But one thing that science is all about is not being settled. You know, if you say the science is settled, you've just reveal yourself to be unscientific. The point about science is everything is always open. You can, not, you can talk about absolutely everything, except now you can't, right? There is a deeply unscientific movement within science, which tells you that you can't question climate change. You can't question the response to COVID and, you know, any of that stuff. And that's utterly, you know, that that's, we're getting back to Galileo, right? We're getting back to, you know, an official church that says this can be believed and that can't be believed. And, 
you know, we're essentially theologians. We'll tell you what science is all about. That's madness. And incidentally, of course, we all want to think of ourselves as being the ideal type, I suppose. But early on, I was very cautious. I didn't know what was going on. I, you know, when people decided they wanted to rescind their RSVPs to my little daughter's birthday party, I didn't reproach them for that. I thought, well, nobody really knows. There's so much uncertainty. What's happening here? Let's pause and wait and see. I think that was a, a fairly reasonable response. And then when I observed what was happening, I changed the way I looked at things. And I, I don't see a whole lot of that going on in some circles. It's like we have to dig in our heels and regardless of, of the information that comes in that seems to run counter to what we would expect should happen if our theory were true, we're just going to stick with the theory come what may. And I mean, that that's a separate episode because we, we could speculate as to what motivates people to do this and some people just enjoy the moral superiority and all that. That gets us too far afield. I think your book is in a way, even though you you rather playfully start with a chapter called Don't Make Rules in a book on here are 12 rules. I mean, I appreciate that. But these chapters, I think, frankly, are in a way, if not a guidebook to how to be a human being, a reminder of what it is, of, of what we ought to strive for as human beings. I mean, there is something that distinguishes us from other living beings, and that is that is reason, and reason allows us, the fact that we act not simply on instinct allows for curiosity, allows us to look into things that go beyond just satisfying our appetites. And so chapters like be interested in other people, be creative, be open to the world, don't be smug, these are things that people need to, to hear these days. But I feel like it would be wrong of me not to ask you this. There are a lot of little insights in this book but I wonder if there's one big insight that motivates the whole book. And if, if there were one such insight, what would you say it is? Golly, you put me on the spot. I guess kind of to summarize what you just said, that which makes us human is our curiosity. And if we didn't have that, if we were satisfied to be bores, we might as well be machines. But let, let me mention one other thing. I, I mean, I close off the book by saying I'm talking about Blaise Pascal, I'm talking about Albert Camus, I'm talking about our wonder at what happens next. I mean, see, our curiosity is about life, but we also have a great curiosity about what happens when we die. That's the basis of religion. Okay. And, and so, you know, Pascal said people who aren't curious about that seem to him to to be monsters of incuriosity, right? So you start with that and you're led to wonder, you know, what our relationship with God is, which was Pascal's question, or if you don't believe in God, which is Albert Camus, what sense we make out of life. And Camus said, famously, he said, the only true philosophical question is suicide. Right. What why did he say that? Because you know, the question about suicide is what's the point to life? And I agree, okay, although I turn it around a little bit, I want to say the really important philosophical question is boredom. We're made as curious people. We can't stand being bored. Why is that? Well, it's what makes us human. It's why having a free choice matter. It's why choices matter. It's why freedom matters. And it's why all of life is written into that question. Well, the book is Curiosity and its 12 Rules for Life by Frank Buckley, our guest today. And you'll find it linked on the show notes page, which is tomwoods.com slash 1886. Professor Buckley, thanks so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right, folks, let's say something about another unlikely topic on the Tom Woods Show, and that is board games. I have a listener who's created a really great site for people who love board games and who love family board games, but good ones, not boring ones from 20 years ago where you're, you want to jump off a bridge because the game is so boring. The website is weplaytolearn.com, but the two is a number two. We play the number two, learn.com. And the idea is to find fun games that will actually get played. 
So their reviews rate games across four different age groups, including a family rating for parents and kids playing together. And then their fast facts help you know right away if a game is right for you. So they cover game time, number of players, best ages, and a whole lot more. And they even share custom rules that make the games more fun. And last but definitely not least, they highlight how these games can be an integral part of learning. So whether you're trying to practice specific skills or looking for homeschool ideas or just want to have fun with your kids, their reviews are here to help. And they just launched a YouTube channel with engaging videos showing step-by-step how to play some of their favorite games. So check them out at We Play To Learn. Remember, the two is the number two. WePlayToLearn.com. And it's a lot of fun. I love this idea. And by now you know that the good folks at WePlayToLearn.com used old Woods's link to get their web hosting, which means they got a good price from a great company, and they also get my bonuses, which includes telling you good folks about the great work they're doing. So if that seems like an appealing deal to you, then check out tomwoods.com slash publicity before you start your website and can find out the things I can do for you at no extra cost. All right, tomorrow we've got our friend Adam Schneider, who is multi-talented, coming on to talk to us from Canada about the horrors going on up there. Just when you think it can't get worse, well, in Canada, it does. But there are bright spots here and there. We're going to also talk about those. So make sure you don't miss that. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.